Okay. So heads I propose to her, tails I don't. Order the buckler and shield and prepare for battle. Ah, good morning, Canyon Springs. How are you guys doing today? Oh, I'm so excited about this week, Vacation Bible School. I'm so excited. Fired up. Who's working it? We're pray for these people, man. By about 1 o'clock every day, they're going to be exhausted. Just accept it. It's, it's amazing. You know, the cool thing is, you're gonna, you work so hard all week, but the difference you will make is going to be amazing. And we see it. We see it all the time. Last year, I think they had 75 kids um, give their life to Jesus. Um, I've got my buddy Jill here who walked through this, what, 16 years of it? Was that right? 16 years of it? And every year you watch kids come walk to this relationship with Jesus. It's just, it's just amazing. Okay, Jelaine prayed already for it, but I got to do it. I just, I just have to. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold somebody's hand. Uh, if you like them, if you don't like them, you know, tell them. And let's just lift this up. Lord Jesus, I pray that this place would be holy ground. I pray that kids would have fun. I pray that they would see that following you isn't a drudgery. It's not a to-do list. It's a great way to live your life. Be with the singing and the dancing and the games and the storytelling. Be with all of our leaders. God, use this place to change the world this next week. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys. Um, today we are starting this series called Divine Direction um, because wouldn't you like to have a little direction in your life? Wouldn't you like to know the major important decisions of your life? Wouldn't you like to be able to have some help with that? Uh, and I'm going to start off with a quote. I'm going to read it. You tell me if you agree with this quote. Okay, you ready? Craig Rochelle, put it like this. The importance of decision making. Who you are today is a result of the decisions you made in the past, and the decisions you make today will become the stories you tell in the future. Would you agree with that statement? I mean, it's really hard to dispute that statement. Who you are today is as a result of just millions and millions of decisions that you've made. What you are, what you look like, and, and, and what you do for a living, all of those things. Just think about one area, all right? What you do for a living. All of the decisions that took place for you to get to the place where what you do for a living is what you do for a living. Let me just have a short list. Well, what did you study? What was your major? How much schooling did you get? What grades did you get? Who did you cheat off to get those grades? All of those decisions made you go into the career that you're in. Okay, how about uh, your family, the family that you came from? How many decisions were made in that? Uh, what part of the country did they grow up in? Did they even grow up in this country? How much money did your parents have? How much did they value education? Were your parents strong disciplinarians? How many siblings did you have? Did your parents just stop at one kid? How many of you? Parents just stopped at one kid. You're the only child. All right? We got we have a few here. Okay. How many other, you know, your parents kept going until they got it right? Right? Yeah, that's right. Who's the youngest? Who's the youngest? Yeah? Okay, it's here for party people, right? finally got it right, can stop with me. Okay, think about the family that you're in right now. How many decisions had to be made? Uh, did your dad like blondes or brunettes is part of that decision? Um, did you like tall guys or short guys, right? It's obvious though, tall guys, man, 6'1". Uh, it might have come down to this question way back when. Did you like his mullet? <laughs> I mean, we are just a result of all of these decisions made in the past. Millions and millions and millions of decisions. And some of them were made with great thought um, and great intention. Other decisions that you made in your past sounded like this. Hey, hold my beer, watch this. <laughs> right? Now, it's important what kind of decisions we make. Because I have to tell you something, they are not over. And the decisions you make now will make a difference off into the future. 
there are still lots of decisions to be made. And some of you are right in the middle of some difficult decisions. You know, how should I parent my kids? What should I prioritize with my kids? You know, how much should I push education on them? Should I stick it, should I stick with this marriage that I'm in? I mean, that's not a decision that you talk about in the courtyard of church because sometimes people get embarrassed by that, but I know that there are people today who are battling that decision. Should I hang in there with that person? Some people are battling, hey, you know what, I hate my career. Should I switch and do something else? Some of you are, are way before that. It's uh, what college should I go to? What major should I follow? How do I want to invest my life? Some of you are wondering, maybe you're nearing, the, you know, you're, you're, you're nearing the end of your career and you're wondering, how can I leave a legacy with the rest of my life? Wouldn't it be amazing if you and I could get some direction in that? And not just direction, not just a wise friend, but divine direction. Wouldn't it be great if there was this God that could tell you what to do, right, and lead you along that path? Now, a lot of you walked in the door. That's the reason why you're at church is because you believe in a God that can actually do that, an all-knowing God that can lead you down that path. But there are probably other people in this room that the only reason you're here is because your kid's going to VBS. You're not even sure you believe in this God, right? You know, all of this, you're not, you're not sure you're totally buying. But let me ask you this question. What if it is true? What if there really is a God and he really does love you and he wants to direct your steps. I love this verse. It's in Proverbs chapter 4, and it says this, Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. You, you follow what God wants you to do. He will literally extend your life. I will instruct you in the way of wisdom, and lead you along straight paths. How would you like to not just be wandering around? But you know where you're going. And that path is straight. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Wouldn't you rather run than walk? You know, I, I don't know anybody who wouldn't want these verses to be true of them. For the next several weeks, we're going to look at how we can lean on this God who can direct our steps and make it straight and keep us from stumbling. So here's how I'd like to start today. I want you to just bow your head. And we give you about 45 seconds of silence to go before God and just, you know, you can ask him anything you want. Let me make a couple suggestions. There are some of you in this room who are seriously considering a major life move right now. And maybe it's a career change or it's a house change or it's maybe it's a relational change and you're, you don't know what to do. And if you are in that season, just take these next seconds and ask God to speak to you into them. And if that's not you, if you don't have a big major decision in your life to be made right now, then maybe just pray this. Say, God, help me to follow you. Help me to, help me to listen to what you have to say about my daily life. Or maybe you even want to start earlier than that and just say, God, you know, I don't even know if I believe in you. Would you show me that you're real today? But we're going to take 45 seconds of silence. And I just want you to give this, you, you're, you're here already. Let's have God speak to you. Just have him take this moment right now. Lord God, I pray that you would speak to us today. I pray that you would go beyond my words, that, that people might even hear something that's not even said.
but that you're speaking into their life today. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Today I want to talk about, you know, just some basic steps to take in decision making. And, you know, I think the reason why people struggle with decisions might not be what you think it is. It's not because you're not smart enough. It's not because you're not intelligent enough. It's not because you're foolish with your decisions. One of the reasons why I think people struggle today with decision making is because we have to make so many decisions. I mean, we have, we have more decisions to be made now about basic, simple stuff than ever before at any time in history, and I can prove it to you, all right? One image to prove it to you. Ready? All right, show it. Right there. Have any of you ever seen one of these machines? This is the Coca-Cola Freestyle machine, and you can make 150 different drinks with that machine. Have you ever seen that? You wander over to it, and it's just, it's just baffling. And, and, I, and I don't even know what to do. I got 150 different drink choices. And what makes it worse is if somebody comes up behind you. <laughs> don't rush me, man. It's 150 different ones. And if you combine two different drinks, you know how many drinks you can make with the Coca-Cola? For, just two. Just two different ones. Over 8,000 different drinks with that machine. Right? I, I looked this up this last week because this is what I do for a job. And there's a, there's a website called SeriousSeats.com that rated the best mixes of drinks. Can you believe that that is a job that somebody has? But, but here's the drinks, okay? The Mezzo Mix, Coke and Fanta Orange. I know, right? I think I just got a cavity just saying it. There's Rasparilla, Barks Root Beer, and Fanta Raspberry. I mean, honestly, when was the last time you drank Fanta anything? <laughs> half and half, Diet Mr. Pib, and Minute Maid Lemonade Light. Ugh. Okay, the 11-year-old. Any guesses what the 11-year-old is? What's the 11-year-old? Everything. <laughs> Just everything. But that wasn't my favorite drink. My favorite drink on this list was, according to SeriousSeats.com, was the strawberry daiquiri. You see, I didn't even know that rum was an option <laughs> with the Coca-Cola Freestyle machine. Um, now, if you think it's overwhelming to buy a soda these days, walk into this place. Right? Tall, grande, vente, calf, decaf, half-calf, milk, soy, cream. Ah! I, I, I don't, I'm terrible at it, too. Sometimes I'll just go in and I'll just point <laughs> that one. Make it for me, please. I, it's overwhelming. Okay, listen to this. Starbucks Global Chief Marketing Officer says that it offers more than 80,000 drink combinations. Mix all those 80,000 drink combinations. There's another website I checked it out from the Huffington Post. They have an article on the most obnoxious Starbucks drinks offers. Here's number one. Okay, you ready? It's an iced half-calf ristretto venti four-pump sugar-free cinnamon dulce soy skinny latte. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. How many decisions? I mean, some of us just want to, you know, forget it. I, I'm just going to go to McDonald's and get a cup of coffee, right? Because there's one. Because it's easier that way. Um, I gave a message maybe about six months ago because my daughter, uh, Daphne, that we adopted, did you know that? Um, <laughs> was coming in, and I, it was all about Oreos. I don't know if you remember that, the different choice of Oreos. I thought it's going to be so exciting for me to take her to the store and show her all of these different Oreos. There's, there's peanut butter, and there's lemon, and you know that there's Fruity Pebble Oreos, and there's Swedish Fish Oreos. And, and I even brought all the Oreos and bought them, and you guys tested them out. Because I thought... What would be so exciting is to just take her to the store and, and have, have show her all the choice. Let me tell you something. About three days into Daphne coming to the United States, we were asking her all these questions. Do you want to do this or do you want to do that? Do you want to do this or do you want to do that? you want to eat this or do you want to do that? And about two days in, she stopped talking altogether. And every time we would ask her a question, all we would get is this. Because there are so many choices to be made in this country. It was completely overwhelming. And we just had to say, no, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And that helped her to 
navigate through life. We just went on vacation about a week ago to a place down in Encinitas. Uh, there's a place called Handel's. Anybody been to Handel's in Encinitas? Oh my gosh, best ice cream place I've ever been to. Over 50 different homemade ice creams that you can, that you can order. Um, and, and it's amazing. You know why they call it Handel's, right? Man, this stuff is so good. You know what Daphne ordered at Handel's? That's right, vanilla. I threw her out of the family. I mean, this is life, right? Drinks and Netflix. Have you ever just turned on Netflix and just done this for a half hour? Ah, otherwise, too much. This is called, marketing people call it overchoice. This was called in the marketing world. Psychologists call this decision fatigue. And decision fatigue is that you have to make so many decisions that you lose your ability to make good decisions just because it is so overwhelming. And life can be like that. What career should I go into? What, pi- what kind of career should I go into? What part, little part of this career should I go into? And how long should I do it? And where should I live? And how should I raise my kids? And what should I push them into? Should they do softball? Should they do, you know, football? What, what, so many. It's overwhelming, right? Listen, God tries to make it easy on us. And so this morning, I want to look at, um, I only have two points today, right? I thought I'd hear a cheer after that, but I only have two points. All right. Because God wants to make it easy on us. He doesn't want us to suffer from overchoice and overthinking it. And the first thing to help you make good decisions is this. You need to understand this, that God is more concerned with who you are than where you're going. He's more concerned with who you are than where you're going. Craig Rochelle put it like this. Put who before do. Who you are before what you do. Now, there are a couple times in the Bible where God tells somebody specifically to do something. They go, Nehemiah, go build that wall. And Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Moses, go save my people out of Egypt. A couple of times like that. 99% of the rest of the Bible has nothing to do with where you're going, what you're doing, where you're living. None of that. It all has to do with who you are as a person. If you have a Bible, open it up to Colossians chapter 3. All right? You don't have your Bible, that's fine. I think the verses will be here, but I always recommend you bring your Bible so that you can highlight verses. And I have to tell you that I'm going to read you 17 verses. I'm going to read you a lot of verses. So there's maybe some things you want to come back to later. But let me read you. And as I read, see if anything jumps out at you regarding what God wants us to do with our life. Colossians 3, verse 1 says this Since then you have been raised up with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. See at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, it's like this long list, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry, Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. For Christ is all, and he's in all. Okay, that's one list. Another list. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other. Forgive each other. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs with the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whew, a lot of stuff, right? 
Okay, some of you can stop answering your email right now, all right? Listen, what on that list was a go here, go there, this should be your career? Nothing. Everything on that list had to do with who we are as people. Let me just recap. Get your mind right. Put to death your earthly nature. Get rid of anger, rage, malice. Don't lie to each other. Clothe yourself with compassion and kindness. Be thankful. Bear with each other. Forgive each other. Sing with gratitude. Look, Bible is filled with challenges, and almost all of them have to do with who you are as a person, what God is doing in your life. I got to tell you, he is way more concerned with who you are than where you're going and what your job is and what your career is and where your house is, whether it's on this side of Pomerado or that side of Pomerado. God cares about our hearts. Now, love this line. It's right in the middle. You might, maybe you missed it. It says, do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self with its old practices and have put on the new self. You know, you read these verses, it sounds like this big giant to-do list. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Do this, do that, do this, do that. You know what? If that's what the Bible is, honestly, me, I want nothing to do with it. I don't want a to-do list. I don't need this to-do list. I don't need cut your hair like this. Don't listen to music like that. I don't want anything to do with that. And some of you grew up with that kind of thing in the church, right? That's not what this is. It's not a bunch of to-do lists of things to do and things not to do. What he is saying is, take this off, put this on. Let me see if I can illustrate that for you. So um, we adopted this girl named Daphne. Don't know if you knew that. And I, I, this would be the last adoption illustration until about five more minutes, okay? <laughs> now, Daphne is overwhelmed with choices, but the choices that she is not overwhelmed with, that she has fully embraced, you know what? Shopping. Girl loves shopping. And she don't care, you know, Ross and Tilly. She went to the mall for the first time. <sighs> we went garage sailing yesterday. All kinds of clothes choices. And man, she loves picking out clothes. This and that and oh man, and mixing this and jewelry and all of that. Now, do you know why Daphne has become so good at making choices like that? Because since Daphne got here in January, she has gained 20 pounds. We have taken her to the doctor, and the doctor says she is now right where she's supposed to be. Uh, she's actually grown two inches in height since eating on a regular basis. The reason why she is shopping is because she needs to because she has taken off that old stuff and she is putting on new stuff. Taking off those old ill-fitting clothes, putting on stuff that fits and is comfortable. Listen, this is what these verses are talking about. Man, it's time to take off that old stuff. Time to take off the anger and the rage and the lust. Because what good did that do you anyway? What good did your unforgiveness do you? Man, it just made everybody angry and it got you in all kinds of fights. Yeah, take that off and put on compassion and put on kindness and put on forgiveness and step back and watch what happens in your life and in your relationship when you put on the new stuff. Man, maybe it's time for all of us to go shopping. Look, God really doesn't care that much about your job. I mean, I know he does. He does. He really cares about that, but he doesn't care nearly as much as he cares about who you are as a person and who you grow into be. And let me just say this too, because I know that there are people that are going through things that are brutal. You know, I got friends who lost a loved one. I have other people who are struggling that I know they're struggling with mental illness. Other people are struggling with some of the things that their kids are going through. Man, that's I, I hate it. I wish I could take it all away from you. But those issues in your life are developing character and kindness and compassion like nothing else can. Like a good job can't, and like your house going up in value can't, and winning lottery tickets can't. 
We need to focus on what God really cares about. That's who we are. Okay, point number two. Here we go. I want you to know, too, that God is more interested in why you are doing what you are doing than what you are actually doing. He's more interested in why you're doing what you're actually doing than, than what you're doing. Let me read you uh, Proverbs 16. It says, All the person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he'll establish your plans. Okay, how true is this statement? All of a person's ways seem pure to them. Is that true? I have a statistic that will prove that to you. Right? You ready for this? Here it is. 64% of American drivers rate themselves as excellent. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Is that what you are seeing on the 15 freeway? Are you just standing back in awe of how beautifully these people are maneuvering their vehicles through traffic? But 64% of us think we're great, but we don't think anybody else is great. All right? The people that we, are, we know as our friends, we rate them about half as good as we do. All right? And the people that are our age, we rate them as one-third as good drivers as we are. And yet we, you know, it, let me give you a statistic, 80% say they've driven faster than the posted speed limit. You know what that means? It means 20% are lying. 45% say they've driven while excessively tired to the point of falling asleep. More than one-third have sent a text message or email while driving. Yes, people said that more than one-third of people have texted while driving. Okay, yes, 99% is more than one-third. I was in a stoplight. We were coming home from Costco, and I saw somebody from the church. And uh, be, just be careful when you're driving around, because I'm, I'm watching. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I pulled up, because I just wanted to say hi, and I pulled up at the stoplight. We rolled down our windows, and the first words out of our mouth, and I'm not making this up, this was Friday. The first words out of our mouth was, I wasn't texting. <laughs> Isn't that great? For 20 bucks, I'll tell you who it is. <laughs> Meet me in the courtyard. We are all great drivers. All of our ways seem right to us. All of our decisions seem right. You know what? God is not as concerned with what we think. He wants to know what our motives are. And we can get turned around with motives in a lot of different ways. You know, it seems like there's a difference between why we do what we do and the reason we give for what we do. Right? There's a real reason, and then there's a reason we tell our friends. Like, let me just give you a couple examples. You know, I work so hard for the benefit of my kids. I'm just buying this car because I need reliable transportation. You know, I'm serving, but I, I really don't care who notices that I'm serving. I'm posting this photo of myself just because I want to give God the glory. <laughs> And maybe that's true. Or maybe you're a workaholic for you. And maybe you bought that Beamer not just for transportation, but so that people would notice what you're driving. And maybe you posted that picture because you wanted people to notice what you're doing and who you are and how cool you are. Look, let me tell you something. It is almost impossible to end up into the, in the right destination when you start out with the wrong motives. It's almost impossible to get to the right place when you start out with the wrong motives. Let me show you a different way. Colossians 3.17 says this, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, everything we do for us becomes meaningless. Everything I do to make you like me better, to, to try to, to push my career more for me, all of those things, buying cars for me or, or better clothes so that you have a better view of me, all of those things are meaningless. But everything we do for Jesus is valuable. And it doesn't matter how big or small it is. I mean, some, some people... I think you're crazy for feeling this way, but some people are stay-at-home moms or dads and they think they are wasting their time. That is a misuse of their time that they should be doing something so much more important. And I got to tell you, 
as long as you are doing it for Jesus, you are changing a life. And you are, you know, you feel all that, that carrying and hugging and wiping is a waste of time. Let me tell you, wipe for Jesus, all right? <laughs> because that time is valuable. That time can make your legacy. Some of you are in a dead-end job. You know what else is at that dead-end job? You know what? People are at that dead-end job. People that you could reach out to and love and pray for and get involved in their lives. You know what? It, the dead-end job is meaningless, but the people are not. You do it for Jesus, see what happens. You know, some of you are waiting for your career to begin. And so you get involved, you don't really have anything to do, so you get involved with this homeless guy who holds a sign at Mira Mesa. And that time that you spend feeding that homeless person may mean more this, than this great career that you're hoping will start. Look, everything we do for Jesus is valuable. And everything we do for ourselves ends up kind of meaningless. Now, I want to I end with a story. Okay, I've been doing a lot of reading to you, but this is so worth it. Uh, this is from one of my favorite authors. John Ortberg wrote this based on an article he saw. It's, the, the book is called All the Places to Go, How Will You Know? It's a really good book on decision making. If you want it, I can send that to you. There's a front page article in the San Francisco Chronicle about a metro transit operator named Linda Wilson Allen. She loves the people who ride her bus. She knows the regulars. She learns their names. She will wait for them if they're late and make up the time later on her route. A woman in her 80s named Ivy had some heavy grocery bags and was struggling with them, so Linda got out of her bus driver's seat to carry Ivy's grocery bags onto the bus. Now, Ivy lets other buses pass her stop so she can ride on Linda's bus. Linda saw a woman named Tanya at a bus shelter. She could tell that Tanya was new to the area. She could tell she was lost. It was almost Thanksgiving, so Linda said to Tanya, you're out here all by yourself. You don't know anybody. Come on over for Thanksgiving and kick it with me and my kids. Now they're friends. The reporter who wrote the article rides Linda's bus every day. She said Linda has built such a little community of blessing on that bus that passengers offer Linda the use of their vacation homes. They bring her potted plants and floral bouquets. When people found out she likes to wear scarves to accessorize her uniforms, they started giving them as presents to Linda. One passenger upgraded her gift to a rabbit fur collar. The article says that Linda may be the most beloved bus driver since Ralph Cramden. <laughs> you got to be old to get that joke. <laughs> Think about what a thankless task driving a bus can look like in our world. Cranky passengers, engine breakdowns, traffic jams, gum on the seats. You ask yourself, how does she have this attitude? Her mood is set at 2.30 a.m. when she gets down on her knees to pray for 30 minutes. The Chronicle says there is a lot of talk about the Lord, says Wilson Allen, a member of the Glad Tidings Church in Hayward. When she gets to the end of her line, she always says, that's all, I love you, take care. Have you ever had a bus driver tell you, I love you? People wonder, where can I find the kingdom of God? I'll tell you where. You can find it on the number 45 bus riding through San Francisco. People wonder, where can I find the church? I will tell you, behind the wheel of a metro transit vehicle. Let me ask you a question. Out of your list of important jobs, things that you want to spend your life doing, where would bus driver be? I mean, do you set out as a kid to be a bus driver when you grew up? Maybe, maybe some of you, when you heard that, you know, that song, the wheels on the bus go round and round. But after about, you know, five or six years old, you set your heights bigger. You wanted to be an athlete. You wanted to be a lawyer to make a lot of money. Or, well, maybe not lawyer. But you set your sights on something big. But not bus driver. You went back to your high school reunion. You told people you were a bus driver. How would you feel? I got to tell you something. 
God doesn't really care that much about your high fluent position or, or how important people think you are. I mean, he does care. He, he really does care about your job, but not nearly as much as who you are because he knows that if he's got you, he can use you anywhere. And even if it's just driving a bus. We can be so overchoiced, it's overwhelming. So let's make it simple. Right? Let's make it simple. Let's do this. Let's be the people God wants us to be. And let's let our motives be pure. And let's see what God does with us. All right? Tell you what, would you do me a favor, would you bow your head? I want to start like this, and I just want to say, look, there is a God that maybe you never knew that isn't about rules, but is about loving you and about bringing out your best. It's a God that knows you so well that he can help you make good decisions. He, he, it's a God that, that is so amazing that he can take your worst situations and make them great. And if you would like to know this God, it becomes very simple. You just, you just pray to him and just say, God, I want you in my life. And Jesus will forgive your sins. You say, God, forgive me. Forgive me of the things I wish I'd never done. I want to give my life to you. I want to put you behind the wheel of the bus. And if you do that, God can come into your life and he can change you. And, and, and he can bring peace to your life. He can bring joy to your life. He can bring compassion. He can take off all those old things that hurt you and put on new things that will help you in your relationships. If you want to know that, God, you just pray. Say, dear God, come into my life. I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you instead of me. Now, if you pray that today, it begins a brand new life for you. We'd love to know about it. We have some information on our information table, or you can find one of those white cards in the caddies and fill it out. Uh, you can reach out to me at jack at canyonsprings.org. I'd love to help you in that. Lord Jesus, I pray for my friends, and I pray, God, that you would watch over them and that we would put you first. You'd make us the people that we're supposed to be. And God, as you do that, I pray that you'd help us to change the world. In your name we pray. Amen.